welcome to Cooper Union. I'm Joshua Cooper, your host. And today we're looking at ban the bomb, protect our planet. There's a new treaty that entered into force and it's now time for us to look at next steps. I'm very fortunate to be able to be with three amazing people with decades of experience on peace and human rights and also dynamism in direct action. First is Alan Ware, the global coordinator for parliamentarians for nuclear nonproliferation and disarmament and Yasmin Silva, Partnership Manager for Beyond the Bomb, and Kekishan Basu, founder of Green Hope Foundation and Forbes 30 Under 30. We're at a historic time. On January 20th, Biden was inaugurated with a new Congress that could make a difference. On January 21st, President Biden announced the renewal of the START Treaty, and Putin agreed a few days later. But really important as well, January 22nd was the entry into force of the Treaty on Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, TPNW, and on January 27th, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists announced that the doomsday clock remains at 100 seconds to midnight. When we look at all this that's going on in the middle of a COVID crisis, I would like to ask you, Kekeshan and Yasmin, with other issues like climate change and biodiversity loss, human rights, race relations, and the pandemic impacting so much on our lives and futures, why should we be concerned about nuclear weapons that have perhaps kept the peace and have not been used since 1945? Kishan? Sure, thank you for the question. And you know, that is exactly why we should be concerned because why did we wait for so long and how long can we live in fear? And the issue of nuclear weapons remains unaddressed because of this veil of secrecy because it's made out to be a distant and perhaps mythical threat. But you know, ask anyone in Japan and you will find out that uh, for them, it is the most important and relevant aspect of their lives. And even today, a person who talks about it starts crying. Why? A nuclear warhead has the potential to kill millions instantly, and it's the greatest threat to present and future generations. And it's the greatest threat that's created by humankind and literally the most potent pathway to the complete annihilation of humanity and the planet. And I always compare this threat to the sword of Democles because it's hanging by a thin thread that can snap at any moment. And if only the world would stop the suffering from that self-induced myopia and wake up to this threat, we would have lasting peace. And honestly, I find it really ironic that nations should use the pretext of weapons of mass destruction as a deterrent when in reality it is because of these weapons that we still don't have global peace and these are live munitions not something that's kept in a museum so the threat is ever present and must be addressed with urgency thank you kekishan and of course in hawaii on january 13 in 2018 everyone did wake up a little bit more but i think we've forgotten a bit yasmin would you like to continue definitely so at Beyond the Bomb, we like to talk about nuclear weapons is the idea that nuclear weapons are issue zero. There's something that's in the background, something that most people don't think about, and yet they touch our lives in such a myriad of ways, especially in the United States, we don't often think about. Um, really, nuclear weapons have been an environmental racism issue. Look at where we've mined for nuclear materials. Look at where we've tested and stored nuclear waste. This impacts indigenous communities, black and brown communities, and low income communities across the United States. So it's not just this existential idea of nuclear weapons. Through the Trump administration, and even there are plans to continue into the Biden administration of modernizing our nuclear arsenal. And who will that harm? That will continue to harm those exact same communities. So we really need to make steps to stop this, <laughs> um, especially in the United States, because we are a nuclear armed power. We have the opportunity to bridge that gap between the nuclear weapons issue and all of the other social justice issues that are so pressing today. Very important points, and let's see if we could bring Alan in. Alan, is there any possibility that the Biden administration, Russia, and other nuclear armed countries will A, join the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, or B, take other significant steps to reduce nuclear risk in the nuclear arms race and make progress on global nuclear disarmament? Well, thanks, Joshua, and aloha, everybody. Uh, I'm originally from New Zealand, and uh, my country was one of the leaders in the negotiations for this new treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. And I'm very pleased that non-nuclear countries have taken this initiative 
to develop this treaty. Uh, but it is very unlikely that the nuclear armed states or those allied to the nuclear armed states that rely on nuclear deterrence will join this particular treaty. They weren't involved in the negotiations, uh, except for one, Netherlands, and the proposals that Netherlands put into the negotiations to make it more possible for nuclear armed states or allied states to join were not accepted. So in a sense, it, it is a treaty of the non-nuclear states. But What's important is it elevates the issue so that people know about it, and then they can call on the nuclear armed states and allied states to take other steps for nuclear disarmament. And we have a huge opportunity with the Biden administration because Joe Biden um, in the election campaign was putting forward uh, policy proposals. He's already made announcements. As you mentioned at the start, he already announced, you know, the US will join with Russia in extending the New START treaty. Uh, he's all also said that he'll, he'll work to bring the United States back into the nuclear uh, arms agreement with, uh, with Iran, which doesn't have nuclear weapons, and that nuclear agreement was to prevent Iran getting them. He's already talked about lowering the role of nuclear weapons and possibly even developing a no first use policy, which would bring countries back. Uh, he's talked also about using diplomacy to solve the, uh, the situation with North Korean nuclear weapons. So we have a lot of opportunities, I think, uh, with Biden as President of the United States and with a Congress that is now uh, led by the Democrats so they can support the President. Thank you, Alan. And Kekishan, can you kind of weigh in on this question as well? Sure. I do agree with uh, what Alan just said. And I think that for me, based on the initial uh, indications that the, it, the Biden administration will work to implement its campaign promises, and as was just mentioned, it's already announced the renewal of the START Treaty. And the fact that this administration is keen on going the opposite way of the previous one does make me quite optimistic, even though I think that it's too early to rejoice. But at the same time, uh, this may not result in all of the nuclear armed states joining the TPNW because, you know, how do we deal with North Korea or with Pakistan, states where dictators or the army hold the reins of power? So I think that the next step in this process should be towards getting full disclosures on how much these nations are spending on nuclear weapons. And as Costa Rica reminded us in its UN General Assembly last year, the global military spending was $1.9 trillion in 2019. And to quote a former Canadian Senator, the Honorable Douglas Roche, governments spend on building the conditions for peace only 2.7% of what they spend on preparing for war. That is horrific. And once the general public is aware that their leaders are giving away trillions of dollars in money to the weapons industry while scrounging on spending for healthcare and education, public opinion will turn and either force these leaders to take remedial action or they will elect more prudent people into the parliament. Really great points because we know, especially in this middle of this pandemic, and we know there's other crises like waves coming in facing global civil society, that we must be able to reimagine the way that we live. And we know when people say they want to go back to normal, normal was the problem. And the military industrial complex was one of those aspects. So what political forces in the US and other nuclear armed and allied states are promoting the nuclear arms race? And what action can civil society take to counter these forces to ensure that disarmament steps are taken, Alan? So Kekishan yourself have already indicated one of those, that is the weapons industry. Uh, there's a broad weapons industry, and there's also many of those corporations are also involved in a nuclear weapons industry. So they're making, it's not just the warheads, it's also the delivery system. So the missiles and the submarines, and they're making a lot of money out of this, and they want to keep making money. And that's influencing the decisions of Congress, which is the one that decides in the United States, for example, the budget in the UK, the UK Parliament. We see it played out very clearly in the United States. Go back to when President Obama negotiated the New START agreement with Russia. He took it to the US Congress to be ratified and the entire Republican caucus in the Senate said, we're not gonna support it unless you spend more money on nuclear weapons. <laughs> Basically, they wanted the money for you know, their, 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 in, their industries, which is crazy because if you spent that money on other industries, you'd create a lot more jobs and you have a much better economy and you provide much better products. But that's a very powerful industry. So what do we do about that industry? There's two ways 
ways we can work on this, or three probably. One is direct work on the nuclear weapons budget. So Senator Markey in the United States has got the SANE Act, smarter approach to nuclear expenditure. Until now, he hasn't been able to get a majority because the, the Democrats were in the minority, but now they might be able to get a majority on specific Senate uh, and House measures to cut the nuclear weapons budget. That's similar, we're doing similar actions with some of our parliamentary members in the UK and in France. But there's more than that. This whole industry is also, many of these corporations are on you know, the market um, and you can invest. And there's countries, there's uh, cities, there are banks, there are pension funds, there are universities investing in the nuclear weapons industry. So we can call on those to stop investing. Already four governments have, my government, New Zealand, none of the public funds are allowed to invest in the nuclear weapons industry now. We can move our universities to do the same, our cities, our, uh, our religious organizations if they have funds. Any investor can actually shift and think, I'm not going to invest in the nuclear arms race. I'm going to invest in better things. Oh, great points. And I know when Honolulu hosted the US Conference of Mayors, they had resolutions looking at important issues related to nuclear. Kekishan, would you like to add some perspectives on that? Absolutely, yeah. The huge profits that the arms industry make are the real drivers behind the charade. And the political leaders are often just mere puppets controlled by these arms barons who pour billions into their campaign funds and then it's quid pro quo after they get elected. So leaders also shroud the nuclear arms discourse either in national security or in right-wing nationalism or both as we're seeing in some of the countries now and we as civil society continue to fall for it. And honestly, the only route to negate this charade is through education. We need to build awareness and that is why disarmament education is so important as it will make the general public aware and thereby enable us to de-link national security and patriotism from nuclear weapons and lay bare the real agenda of profit and megalomania that drives this insane race. And disarmament education holds the key to removing the mists of secrecy and misinformation that allow these nations to justify their nuclear agenda to the masses. And that is our mission at Green Hope Foundation, where we use education for sustainable development to engage those who are left behind. And our work on peace and sustainability is not about strikes and protests, but through grassroots actions and disarmament education that make people aware about the threat of nuclear weapons to eliminate the misconception that nuclear weapons are an adult issue. It's not, it affects all of us and therefore it is upon us as humanity across generations and as global citizens to take action. And as we say at Green Hope Foundation, we want books, not nukes. Excellent point. And so when you look at that, the intergenerational is absolutely essential. We focus on that as well and the international approach, absolutely essential. And what was also crucial is sustainable development goals, the 2030 agenda, the Paris Agreement, both of those are positive frameworks how we can ensure a human rights-based approach to ensure for freedoms for all people around the planet. Yasmin, you were amazing in the last round because you shared the aspect of indigenous rights from the production, the mining, and I'd like to honor Carrie Dan who was working with the Western Shoshone campaigns. It's always been conducted on indigenous lands in the US, around the world. It's always done on indigenous places. And so I'd really like you to also share about some of the other movements that are mobilizing, especially since you coordinate with partnerships. Definitely. Um, so I just wanna uplift a lot of what Kegashan said as well in the idea that really, if we are here to battle corporate and moneyed powers, we need a robust grassroots movement in order to counter that. Because when there's money power, what can counter that in equal measure? That's people power. Um, and so it, it has a lot, as she said, to do with education and really giving people the tools to engage with their elected officials. Um, because another thing we see in the United States is a lot of elected officials believe that because this is a shrouded process, this is something that's kept out of the public eye, and because they don't hear about it from their constituents, those who are agnostic and who could step up and be champions don't because they don't think it's an issue that their constituents care about. And we know that that's just wrong. Um, so in terms of other movements and things happening, so 
besides obviously in the United States, there's a really huge push for no first use that would essentially make it so the United States makes a declaratory policy that it would not use a nuclear weapon first. Is it abolition? No. Is it a step towards abolition and something necessary to bring allies and other nuclear armed powers to the table for diplomacy? I definitely think so. But in terms of restorative justice, as you mentioned and I mentioned before, so many indigenous low income and folks of color across this country have been hurt by the nuclear system and they are not being compensated at all uh, or recognized. A small number of people have through an act that was instituted in the 90s called the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act. Um, and that gave healthcare as well as compensation to those who've been impacted by radiation poisoning because of our nuclear weapon system. But that is set to expire in 2022. And that only covers a very small margin of people who we now know have been impacted. And so besides pushing for these policies that decrease tensions globally, like no first use to really pave the way for disarmament, we at Beyond the Bomb are also looking at these domestic policies that will help people who've already been hurt. Thank you so much. And that really is the point in point that we have to consider. It is people power. And I believe you used to see one of the former UN Secretary General say there's a new superpower, and that is people power when it was rising up against war. And what I think we can look at next is what we have to do together when we look at usually the UN Security Council Permanent Five and look at the issue of the nuclear armed and allied states. They've all said they will not join this new treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Are there steps that the countries ratifying the TPNW can take to make real impact on the nuclear arms race? Alan, would you like to share a bit? Yeah, just firstly, I want to add a little bit more to the people power because a people power without sort of guidance into policy um, doesn't get anywhere. Remember, you know, in the 1980s, there were millions of people marching and, and gathering in like New York and Bonn and Hyde Park. Um, but there wasn't really a good global focused uh, process for where to take that energy into actual policy change. So I think what the organizations like our, our network of parliamentarians on nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament, working with Beyond the Bomb and working with the World Future Council are looking at is to turn people power into effective policy change. So that means building the engagement with mayors, with parliamentarians, with senators, with legislators. Uh, and, and then that's important also to, to support you know, those legislators that are wanting to make a difference. They need the support of the people. So that engagement is very, very important. So that's the first point. The second point is what can the non-nuclear states do about more than just signing on to a piece of paper, a treaty? You know, can they then take action that will actually make it a significant impact on the policies and practices of the nuclear weapon states? And I think there are at least two ways that they can, after signing on to the treaty, they can then adopt measures that will have an impact. And these are measures that some countries have already taken. Uh, one is to prohibit the transit of nuclear weapons through your airspace, across your land space, and in your territorial seas. This is actually putting a constraint on the nuclear armed states. You know, they are flying bombs, you know, like for, to replace the bombs that they've got deployed in European countries, some of the NATO sharing, you know, and if they are said, told by a country, sorry, you can't fly that plane across our airspace because we think it's got a nuclear bomb on, the, this is going to make the world sort of wake up. I mean, people probably don't even realize that these nuclear bombs have been flown in planes through their, through their skies, or that all the weapons are on submarines, you know, they're out of people's sight, so people don't think about them. But if these countries say, you're not allowed to send those submarines through our territorial seas, people are going to pay attention to this. The other one, which we've already mentioned before, is divestment. If these countries take on and adopt policies of non-financing of nuclear weapons, meaning none of the public funds, none of the sovereign wealth funds, the pension funds, you know, other uh, funds that the government manages or government-run banks, you know, are allowed to invest in the nuclear weapons industry, and that picks up. At the moment, there's only four governments that have divested from the nuclear weapons industry. So it hasn't made a big impact yet. But we know what happened to South Africa, you know, when there was the big divestment campaign that was launched in the United States. It put a real economic push on South Africa to 
change their apartheid policy. So we can see the same happening if the divestment campaign picks up, not just at government level, but throughout society, as I mentioned, universities, cities, you know, religious organizations and governments, divesting from the nuclear arms race could have a real impact. Thank you so much, Alan. And you also bring up the important point about what small states can do. I remember when Palau, led by matriarchal society, demanded a nuclear-free constitution and all of the energy it took for the U.S. to try to change that position. And that's what it really is. It's people power and elected officials. And I do agree, it's definitely policy. And now we have a framework that we can move forward. Kekishan, what's your perspective on that? No, honestly, the simple answer is stop dealing with the nuclear armed states and allies because states that have ratified the TPNW need to come together and use their combined economic might to stand up against the NATO and the nuclear armed states. And they must not allow their markets to open up to goods and services from the nuclear armed nations. Because at the end of the day, this is a game of profits. And this is the only language that the nuclear arms nations understand. Really good point. And that's why I think the economic divestment, the campaigns that we're looking at are really looking at trying to put the pressure where it matters most or what that element of society values. And since they do look at profit beyond people and they look at prosperity more than they look at a planet, it's important that we bring all those elements together. Is there a law prohibiting nuclear weapons that is binding on the nuclear armed states and how can this be used to advance nuclear disarmament? And this one I have for all three of you because you're all doing such amazing advocacy around the world. Alan, would you like to start? Okay, I'll start, but I'd like to say two things about law. Law is not only about prohibiting you know, bad behavior, behavior that's you know, against the norms, but it's also about facilitating the resolution of conflicts. And I think we need both aspects because the United Nations has many legal mechanisms in place that enable countries to achieve their security without relying on the threat or force or on nuclear weapons. So this is the alternative for those states that say, we have to have nuclear weapons for our security. We can come and say, actually, there's many legal political mechanisms for achieving security without nuclear weapons. The United Nations Charter sets out many of those, um, and there are also regional organizations. On the, on the prohibition side, yes, there is already law that has been affirmed by the International Court of Justice and the UN Human Rights Committee that makes the threat or use of nuclear weapons illegal and also establishes an obligation for the elimination of nuclear weapons. This includes international humanitarian law, which is the laws applicable in wartime. During wartime, you, you're allowed to target military targets, but not civilians, not neutral countries. You're not allowed to use indiscriminate weapons. You're not allowed to cause unnecessary suffering to combatants, nor destroy the environment for future generations. Nuclear weapons do all those things. So the International Court of Justice in 1996 said the threat of use of nuclear weapons is generally illegal. And this was followed up in 2018 when the UN Human Rights Committee said actually the threat or use of nuclear weapons is also a violation of human rights, the right to life. And both of those bodies said there's an obligation to eliminate nuclear weapons. That law is binding on, on the nuclear armed states and allied states. So even if they don't join this new treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, they have an obligation not to use nuclear weapons and to work for their elimination. Alan, thank you so much for raising the UN Charter, which every country has agreed to. Mm -hmm. Also, more importantly as well, the International Court of Justice ruling, which I know you were very much involved with. And then most recently, the UN Human Rights Committee, because most countries have ratified the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And that important part about right to life is definitely expressed there. So all those are absolutely other angles that we can use in a way to, to hold down and apply moral pressure and legal pressure on those countries. Kikishan. I absolutely agree with that, that nuclear weapons literally go against everything that international humanitarian law states of mandating doing no harm. But whether uh, these nations sign the TPNW treaty or not, it's now been ratified and it's come into force. So it's now up to us, our multilateral institutions and civil society to enforce it. And citizens of these nuclear armed states will play a key role in forcing their leaders to abide by these laws. And so that is the route to our advocacy. And that is the route that we must take to achieve a world free of nuclear weapons. Thank you, Yasmin. Yeah, 
So I, I don't want us to overlook the non-proliferation treaty as well, the NPT, which five of the nuclear armed states are treaties party to. Uh, and while I know that the NPT has fallen short of a lot of our hopes in the non-proliferation and nuclear elimination community, I, I don't want to overlook the fact that they said, they being the nuclear armed states, said that they would pursue in good faith ways to eliminate nuclear weapons. And I think that, that those of us who live in nuclear armed states, that is our in to applying pressure. It's definitely not the end all be all, but that is a way to open up that conversation and to pursue legislative and executive in the United States anyway, means to change the nuclear status quo within the United States and set us on that path towards elimination. Mahalo, Yasmin. Kekishan, I thought you did mention, and I really think it's important, I see the Rubik's Cubes of rights around you, the SDGs. Can you maybe share the relation of the Sustainable Development Goals, that 2030 agenda, and nuclear disarmament? Because here in Hawaii, we conducted the first ever voluntary local review uh, spearheaded by Hawaii Green Growth, where we did a report for all four counties saying this is what we're doing on the 2030 agenda and how we're achieving those 17 global goals. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the entire nuclear weapons process from mining, production, storage, and waste siting is based on monumental environmental injustice that disproportionately affects indigenous communities, as my colleagues mentioned. And the armaments industry is also a travesty against East justice and strong institutions, SDG 16, because it is the most potent threat um, against all forms of life. And it also reeks of injustice and inequality, because how can nations waste billions and trillions on these weapons when it could be better used to solve problems of education, of healthcare, sanitation, and during this pandemic, providing ventilators to hospitals that have run out of them? So to create a life of dignity for all, which is the basis of the SDGs, we need to stop this profligate spending on nuclear weapons. And this is why the Sustainable Development Goals are so deeply interlinked to the call for nuclear disarmament. It's an excellent point. We have the funds. We just have to make sure they're going to the right place that will then, of course, allow people to achieve the 2030 agenda, but also realize all their economic, social, and cultural rights that are in peril today. Yasmin, we did start early talking about Biden and the new Congress. What are some important legislation and bills that we should be aware of that we could then apply pressure to our elected officials through this time? Yeah, so I alluded to some of them before and I definitely wanna state them off, but off of Kikashan's point, I we actually at Beyond the Bomb recently did an evaluation of how the $30 billion that the US wants to spend on our ICBM program could be spent. And that could be 726,000 intensive care unit beds, 84,800 ventilators, 363,000 nurses, or 181,000 doctors. And in the pandemic, I think that just seeing where our priorities lie and whether we're invest, what kind of security are we investing in and is it actually secure is a really important question to be asking. But in terms of what is on the table in the United States, so I think divestment is a huge thing. So um, we alluded to Biden having to put together a new budget um, for the next fiscal year, but really a piece of legislation a lot of people don't talk about is the NDAA or National Defense Authorization Act. And within that is a whole slew um, of nuclear spending that, that we can be talking about that's kind of a hidden process from the United States. So if beyond the bomb, we monitor that for our activists and give them moments to plug in. The other pieces of legislation that I think are really important to note are no first use, like I said, um, we're waiting on that to be reintroduced by our champions, Elizabeth Warren um, and Adam Smith. Uh, and then the final piece of legislation that I think people should be monitoring is RECA, that Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, because I think it shows a reinvestment of our priorities. We are saying that harm has been done. We're recognizing that nuclear weapons cause harm, and we are investing in those people that we harmed. So I think they're all three of those are a piece of one big puzzle. Mahalo, Yasmin, and thank you to all of you as well for joining us. It also reminds me of that Ben and Jerry's Oreo puzzle where it shows where our resources are being spent and we need to be hungry for human rights and holistic human security. One last thing I'll end with is the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists did announce that the doomsday clock remains at 100 seconds to midnight. 
the clock is ticking, would you respond? Let's make sure we end nuclear weapons, that we can ban the bomb and protect our planet. Mahalo and thank you for joining Cooper Union.